bonsoir et bienvenue à cette euh, soirée qui fait partie de notre programmation sur l'écologie décoloniale. C'est euh, euh, le deuxième moment de programmation que nous concevons en collaboration avec NA Projects, NA Projects. Euh, la soirée va avoir lieu en anglais et je vais euh, donc maintenant continuer en anglais, mais je vous souhaite la bienvenue. So thank you all for coming tonight for this evening, which is part of our weekend's focus on decolonial ecology. Uh, this is the second weekend of programs that we have conceived in collaboration with the Art Fund focused on sustainability in our project. And Uh, we have with us tonight Christopher Crimes, who is the CEO of that project, and we're very grateful to him and to Bertrand Jacques Berger, um, the founder of our project, for their precious collaboration, um, which has allowed us to go more deeply into some of the themes that really emerge from the works of artists in the exhibition, um, and to bring into relationship practical experimentation and critical thinking. Um, so this weekend we will also have talks tomorrow by uh, notably an artist in the show, William Wasif, uh, who's here with us tonight, who has the uh, mixed media photographic work on the shelves on the wall on this side. Seeds will set us free and then we'll continue with the session with Valentina Carga, Elena Mazzi, and Chiara Scaramena, um, which will look at their artistic research, a number of case studies, and then propose a practical session um, for the public. So please do come back tomorrow afternoon, that's kicking off at 3.30. Tonight, we are very, very pleased to have with us Maria Teresa Alves. Um, she will be in conversation with Natasha Petrosin, Natasha is going to introduce the session for us, but just to say a word, a word about Natasha, who's an independent curator and writer and thinker based in Paris, and whose research interests span um, feminism, curatorial practices, empathy, um, how to slow down institutions, degrowth, and other such, you know, profound dimensions also of decolonial ecology. And she's just curated Contour Biennial in Mechelen, in a very beautiful series of exhibitions and discursive events across the whole last year in tune with the moon's faces. Um, and has in the past also, has recently co-curated the first ever comprehensive exhibition of um, the work of French feminist activist and actress Delphine Zerink. So, um, uh, the other thing I should mention about her is that she co-founded with Elisabeth de Bolissi and Patricia Padgares the uh, weekly, no, sorry, monthly meeting, something you should know, which brings to Paris a lot of very important artists and thinkers or presents to Paris publics. Um, a lot of thinking that otherwise has very little visibility here. So now would you join me in welcoming Natasha and Marie Teresa. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening to everyone, good evening, Maria Teresa. Um, thank you for this introduction. Uh, I'm very honored and very humbled today to be with you in the presence of Maria Teresa Alves, uh, whom uh, um, presence, whose existence, whose work uh, has uh, profoundly moved me and uh, has been moving me since very long time. Uh, since I believe that uh, what Maria Teresa has been doing since so many years and so long and with such conviction and with such courage is actually what all of us, um, either if we are in arts or not in arts, uh, as social beings, as uh, human beings, uh, should have that conviction and that courage. Uh, in order to face and confront um, the political, ecological, 
social, cultural realities that we as, um, particularly we in the Western world and with the societies that the white uh, Western world has created has uh, um, 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 devastated, uh, on what, what, what kind of scale this has devastated other um, civilizations, other cultures. Uh, so um, I think many of my questions today will be actually following Maria Teresa's presentation of her most current research and particularly two of her uh, projects. Maria Teresa is known for working like crazy. Uh, I mean, the, the number of, of uh, ongoing research and projects that you, uh, that you put together, be it in the sense of videos, installations, um, um, meetings, encounters, uh, enabling this, uh, this extremely fragile knowledges that you deal with uh, in uh, uh, with indigenous communities either in, Bra in Brazil or all over the um, Latin America and Central America, most, most specific, specifically, is, uh, is, is very impressive. It's a, I would say, a kind of um, um, a very generous way of how you, one could conceive an archive of, of those knowledges, but it's more than an archive because it's also, of course, your interpretation in visual forms uh, and, uh, and other sensible forms. So um, I think uh, following your presentation, I will probably have a lot of questions on how actually you manage to, to withstand all the uh, difficulties that you encounter when dealing with um, uh, with those situations in which these people live, uh, how do they survive, um, and um, I think we will all probably be listening, should be listening very attentively to what you have to say. But also, what is very, um, so uh, you also write uh, a lot, um, and um, I thought it was, a, I, I was reading your uh, text, um, Decolonizing Brazil, where you say, Colonization is a process that makes us, those who have been colonized, wounded internally, and we must therefore struggle to decolonize ourselves. And I thought that was, um, uh, because we have just uh, talked about the, the word decolonization, uh, and uh, how much this word has actually spread uh, across uh, different branches of academia, throughout the arts, um, but I truly believe that what you have been doing was prior, well, prior to our usage of that word. So, um, yeah, I'll, I will stop here and I'm, I'm looking forward to coming back to you again. <laughs> All right, thank you for coming and I love it when I can control the lighting situation and right now I have all the light and you, my audience, have none. Okay. Um, well, next time I will put that in the contract. Uh, so, I'm going to be, I've been invited to speak on uh, the subject of decolonizing ecology, and that is what indigenous peoples in the Americas have been doing since the invasion began. And I would like to talk about two works I have made, uh, The Return of a Lake, uh, which was made for Documenta, Carolyn's Documenta, and To See the Forest Standing. The first is about Hiko, a community in Mexico, and the second is about a group of indigenous forest agents in the Amazon in Brazil. Uh, Hiko, I speak of because it's a very clear example of colonization, colonization today, and uh, attempts at decolonizing. And it's a very strongly organized community, and I um, worked for, with them since 2009. Okay. So, um, this is going to be a bit of a lecture, a, hist a history lecture, and this is the mandate of the community. They want me to talk about their history, and that's what I have been asked to do. So um, I do this every opportunity I can have. So I became interested in the phenomena of the echo side of a lake in Mexico made by a European, Enigo Noriega Lazo. It was a pamphlet from the Immigration Museum in Spain, which states that Enigo, among his enterprises, the highlight is the desiccation of Lake Chalco and his massive agricultural exploitation. This destruction and colonization process continues to be celebrated today. 
I am intrigued by the idea that in the 21st century, a country in the European Union with its strict environmental regulations celebrates ecocide in a colonial country. The region of Chalco, now I get up. The region of Chalco, had a population of 37,000 before the invasion by Europe. Lake Chalco, is part, Lake Chalco is part of the lake system of, uh, the, of uh, Mexico and the, the Valley of Mexico, which had a population of 2 million before the invasion. So this is the Valley of Mexico. Okay, well, actually, it's a little bit bigger, uh, 2 million. Tenochtitlan, the Mystica capital, which is right around here, had a population of 200,000, more than any European city at the time. I say these numbers because it has been a tactic of the invaders to make believe that there are very few indigenous peoples in the Americas. The textbooks in Brazil, for example, say that there were no indigenous people on the eastern coast. Now, there's the very nice beaches there, a nice rainforest, why wouldn't there be people in that situation? Um, so, to say these numbers is to resist. Lake Chalco is part of five lakes in the basin of Mexico, forming a flexible system to capture excess water from the rain. This is a valley, right? It's all mountains. Uh, and together with the indigenous engineering, it was regulated. The whole system was regulated. The careful water management allowed the inhabitants to practice agriculture all year, even in the dry season, until the Spanish invasions all the lakes were interconnected. Uh, the Chinampas, which are indigenously engineered islands, which according to experts allow for the most intensive and productive agriculture in Mesoamerica, has existed since 1400 before the Common Era. This is a Chinampa. And you make a Chinampa by making like a ba big basket structure and then you put rocks on it, and then you scoop up the, the earth in the lake, which is uh, very uh, rich in nutrients, throw it in there, and then you start your planting of your beans, squash, and corn. You put some aguavete trees. The aguavete tree has a long uh, root. It attaches to the lake bed so that your island is fixed and you don't have to keep searching for it when you want your breakfast. Okay. Lake Chalco was home to about 10 species of fish and 109 species of birds, of which 5 million arrived annually. These Chinampas fed 170,000 people. Chico was inhabited by the Chalcas, and it was given to the invader Hernán Cortés by the Spanish crown. He systematically despoiled the forest and prohibited indigenous people from gathering firewood and herbs. With the arrival of the Spanish, the immediate and deliberate destruction of the hydraulic system began, resulting in a massive export of water, the over-exploitation of their aquifers, and stupidly enough, at the same time, expensive methods of water importation. Now it is an area of extreme hydraulic tension, the result of the negation of the indigenous practice of the cyclical use of water. This is a page from a, to a codex and commissioned by the Tepet Lao Saktak community of a local, uh, they commissioned a local artist, uh, this is the 16th century, uh, to document the abuse inflicted on the community by the tax collector of Cortes. It is a community close to Hiko, which we'll be looking at, and it is 68 pages of, ab uh, of abuses the community suffered. The systematic massive destruction of native flora and fauna also begins with the invasion it is provoked by the introduction of cattle, pigs, goats, sheep, and chicken. Systematic massive destruction of culture and language begins with European Catholic missionaries arriving and burning indigenous temples and codexes such as this one. There are very few um, in existence. Indigenous communities are forced to sell land to pay for Catholic religious festivals, which they must participate in or be fined or declared as heretics. You who live in Europe and know your history know what it means to be declared a heretic. The invaders not only destroyed the balance of the lake system, but prioritized the prevention of flooding of the city of Mexico and the Spanish who lived there. 
This ensured the destruction of the Chinampas and their fur of agriculture in the nearby towns of Xochimilco and Chauco and their indigenous populations. But indigenous communities stubbornly resisted and still do today. The Spanish attempts to completely remove water from the basin. There is an unbroken history of agriculture in the Chinampas of Xochimilco, Tlahuac, Iztapalapa, and Miscui, and that is truly heroic. By 1601, 83% of the indigenous population were dead. Academically, it is said due to European diseases. See the, the Indian body being too weak compared to the European, so that's already a colonial problem right there. Uh, but we must remember there was excessive forced labor and excessive taxation, such as this, which resulted in indigenous people working even more and malnutrition due to theft and deliberate flooding of land by the Spanish. Just 28 years later, there's a further reduction of 50% of the indigenous population. By 1616, Spaniards owned 80% Spaniards owned of the land. The Spanish crown gave religious institutions the concession to exploit the forest of Chalco. The first cathedral in Mexico City was built with wood and the forced labor of the Chalcas. This wood from the door, this is from the forest of Chalco. Throughout the entire province of Chalco, communities were severely affected by the over-exploitation of their forests and they protested. They, the deforestation made open spaces that were occupied by cattle ranches. You see the situation in Brazil? Same colonial repeat. Owned by Spaniards and the forests progressively retreated. By the 17th century, the situation was catastrophic and the indigenous communities complained to the Spanish crown that passed some regulations that went unheeded in Mexico. Another example of a tribute. In 1607, 80,000 wood beams, wood beams are, this is a beam, so wood beams uh, were ordered by the Spanish of the Chalcas. These beams must be cut, prepared, and brought down from the mountains. That means those mountains are deforested. And then we will look at what happens. This is 1607, please keep this in your mind. Because then we'll talk about it later. At a time when many able-bodied men were away at forced labor, sick or dead, the work was left to the elders, women and children. So this is uh, Chauco, the lake, and Hiko is at Red Island in the middle. In the early 1900s, Enigo Noriega Lazo from Columbus, Asturias in Spain, bought the island of Hiko on Lake Chauco. The lake covered 100 square kilometers. He did not buy the lake. That was communal property. He could not buy the lake. He decided to drain the lake, not in discussion with the community, acquiring, therefore, more farmland for free. The lake was a common resource. The Chinapas were destroyed, as was the livelihood of communities, as well as fish and birds that depended on the lake. This is after, the same place after. Soon, Enigo swallowed up 24% of the land in Chauco, a, 20, a total of 23 indigenous towns, villages, and communities were adversely affected and or destroyed by the desiccation, and the local economy was destroyed. His workers were paid two months' wages for a year's work. Indigenous people were arrested, fined, and imprisoned for the use of the common resources of the lake, the fish and the herbs. This is an ashaloto, a type of salamander. It is endemic only to Lake Chalco and neighboring Lake Xochimilco. Only 600 exist in the wild today. Uh, this is Enigo's private army of 250 soldiers. Indigenous people who resisted his usurpation of their lands were machete, beaten, imprisoned, killed, or sent as slaves to the Yucatan. Families were reduced to farms of one quarter of a hectare when eight hectares are needed to minimally, minimally sustain life. This uh, image in the Museum of Immigration is under the adventures of Enigo Noriega in Mexico. They never explain what these soldiers were doing. Enigo Noriega Lazo forcibly removed and, re and relocated the Chalca people living on the island of Hiko to another area in which they were not given enough land to survive. This is Raimundo Martinez, whose grandparents were forcibly taken from Hiko. They lost their homes, agricultural lands with the desiccation of the lake, and because their Chinampas were destroyed. They, like all the other indigenous communities around the lake, supplemented their diet with fish and water birds, which was an important source of food. 
This was all destroyed. In 1910, the eve of the Mexican Revolution, about 99% of the land is owned by the non-indigenous, practicing ranching and monoculture, and devastating European agricultural practices. The Zapatista Revolution, the first one, although it was not successful, did result in the return of some lands to indigenous communities. Lands which were not, however, generally of the highest quality, as is in the case of Chalco, continuation of Spanish territorial colonial practices. The communities having little choice due to the poor condition of the lands which were returned were forced to raise cattle and to practice a new kind of agriculture that depended on irrigation in the dry season. Colonization continues. As the Spanish increased over the land, they also used the rivers for human waste and converted them into open canals to facilitate the flow. An example is the, called the Company River in Chalco, 29 kilometers long, which also empties into the former Lake Chalco, uh, Lake Texcoco. Enigo Noriega converted the river into the canal to assist in the desiccation of Lake Chalco. This canal has the honor of being called the Canal from Hell. It is a conduit for the industrial waste from several factories and of the untreated household waste of 10 municipalities and a population of five million. Okay. And I would suggest if you go to Mexico, you go to that canal, there is a bridge that people have to cross to get the metro to go to work, and I suggest you cross that bridge. The smell is an affront to the high level of indigenous hygiene and a constant reminder of how many days have passed since the invasion. Indigenous sanitary systems did not permit the dumping of sewage into the lake, which was carefully separated and dusted for specific uses. The poor maintenance of the canal causes cracks and several floods, as seen at this picture. In 2000, 6,700 families were affected by diseases caused by the floods. Health authorities denied any evidence of disease colonization. In 2010, the canal wall broke again, 18,000 forced to flee. 2011, again, 3,000 homes under the fetid water for 15 days. The local indigenous population were left to clean up this toxic mess with no protective gear. In the 80s, 14 pumping stations were built to extract water from Chalco to Mexico City but the aquifer could not be charged fast enough to compensate for the high velocity of extraction, and the lake bed began to sink. There was a subsidence of 40 centimeters per year in the area, 40. And this is what that looks like. The land subsidence caused the company canal. You will see in this image that the canal is higher than the land underneath. Right? You see that the houses are lower. That's because of land subsidence. Okay? The canal is 12 meters above the ground level, which is sinking. So imagine what that process is doing to the pipes, the sewage pipes and the drinking. This is what else it does. It uh, opens up craters, 12 meters, uh, no, sorry, craters that are 20 meters deep and four kilometers long. Uh, this, this one crater affected 100 homes. Uh, this is caused because the aquifer is overexploited by 73%. If the water, the wastewater, comes in contact with the lake bed and slips into the cracks, the aquifer will be contaminated forever. Um, this is a new housing development. I would suggest you never buy anything here. Uh, it's dilapidated. It was one year old. It was dilapidated. It is built on a uh, land-filled lake. You can see what's happening. There's water popping up everywhere. Here, there's also, it's full of water. That's the lake coming back. Um, there are 26 housing developments with 384,000 inhabitants, and they are not required to have a functioning sewage system. Okay? All of it flows down the river into the ravines of the valley, emerging into the lake that's now coming back. In 1989, Chalco had uh, only 30% of the population of Chalco had drinking water. That was for two or three days of the week. Only 25% had access to the sewage system. And I would like to say that that drinking water, I would not even drink or take a shower in because it really uh, itches your skin. This is the lake returning uh, because excessive groundwater uh, extraction from Chalco uh, the water is sent to the city of Mexico. It's a federal city. It's, uh, if you do not want your water extracted, you have to 
uh, confront the federal army. That's how you get your water back, okay? Um, so the water has, uh, this is rainwater that has filled up this um, sinking lake, okay? It's now called Lake Tlahuacico because of the two um, the communities around it. As part of my work uh, in Hico for Documenta, the community and I uh, documented uh, all the ecological problems in the area. So, okay, so here is the, the pumping stations that take water to the federal, uh, to the federal city. Uh, and this is the, all this water you see here is because of the lake going down. Um, here is all of this water you're seeing here. This is all sewage, raw sewage. Uh, this is where, so uh, the Chalcas lived here, and they were moved here, where they didn't have enough land. And in this area, during Documenta, it was like June or July, I have it written down there. Uh, it's not in this because uh, this was already uh, made for Documenta. There was an earthquake there for the first time, and that earthquake is connected to this, okay? And it's right where Raimundo Martinez is where the Chalcos were forced to be due to colonization. This is the lake returning, and this is what it is around it. The urban sprawl does not allow the aquifer to be replenished, and because there is no space for the lake to expand during the rainy season, it is surrounded by and it is surrounded by new housing, it floods. And so there's all these houses have flooding problems. So um, with the return of the lake, however, uh, there are now 66 species of birds that have returned of the 109 that did exist there. Um, and now I will go into uh, the more contemporary art part, uh, because part of the reason to talk about this is that um, to say that uh, we cannot continue under a Western idea of division, of ecology, culture, science, all of these is a vision that the Western world likes to make. And that is why I like talking about um, this community because they are indigenous and they do not accept that division, okay? So um, this is the pictograph of Hiko, and it, Hiko means belly button. Yeah here, the umbilical cord, and it is surrounded by the symbol for land, and the symbol for land in Nahuatl is mountains and water. So that is how the original peoples of the area see their land base as land, mountains, and water. So you say, that is where you are from. Water, it's there. And that is not how the invaders saw the land, and until today, they will continue to drain the water and life from Mexico. Indigenous culture um, does not compartmentalize beingness, and one can clearly see this in the daily defense of the water by cultural activists and the local community. When I arrived in Chalco in 2009, I contacted Amaro, Ajenero Amaru Altomirano, the chronicler of the Community Museum of the Valley of Pico. The museum is an initiative of the local community to actively defend their indigenous culture without financial support from the government but under threats and intimidations by the government, the Community Museum has been able to save 5,000 pre-Columbian artifacts from oblivion or destruction, as there is no other institution in the city interested in protecting this cultural heritage. That's colonization today. It never went away. Indigenous communities have never agreed to the idea of post-colonialism. It does not exist. It's, these are some of the people that uh, are, have been or are still involved with the Community Museum. On the upper left is Leticia, she's the co-founder of the museum, she's a nurse. On the upper right is Don Onesimo, who's re responsible for finding some of the most important artifacts in the museum's collections, because he's riding around with his dozen cows up and down looking for grass for them. So he sees things on the ground because he's looking for places for them to eat. So many of the amazing things, I think the jade mask was what he found. There's Christina the botanist, who was at the time making a garden for the museum. And there's Juan, he's a paper collector. And he's found other most amazing things because he's also always looking at the ground trying to pick up papers to sell. Uh, now, 
continuing on colonization, which has never ended. Not only is the water attacked by the current settlers, descendants of Europeans, but also indigenous culture. This is a basketball court built by a developer over the ruins of a pyramid. Construction debris used to fill the lake. It was placed on the side of the road, and a closer inspection was found to contain archaeological remains. There is no way to save this. Federal law prohibits that Hanelo or I touch any of this stuff. And at that time, he received death threats, so we weren't going to be anywhere near touching that. Okay? All these artifacts are now in the lake. Colonialism. The Community Museum of the Valley of Hiko was created by local community in 1996. Soldiers came in several trucks on the opening and threatened to close it down. 14 years later, on August 5th, 2010, 25 police officers wearing bulletproof vests and weapons on the ready invaded the community museum to arrest General Maru Altamirano. There were four of us trying to protect General. Raimundo, he's the one sitting in the middle, he's a school teacher. Yasnia, she's the one on the right, she works in the market selling uh, fruits. And Yawaka, who's a little hidden, he's on the left, he's the local baker, and myself. Don Hanero was and is considered by the local government as being the greatest threat to the region, and this in a region of extreme high crime rate. And he is considered a threat for his work in support of indigenous culture and for the cyclical use of water. Security forces threaten and harass him. This, um, I returned in 2010 and proposed to the community museum to recreate a chinampa. We worked with the Hiro of Tlawa to revive a pair of chinampas and studied what were the best agricultural products suitable for the present situation because the water today is saline, it used to be sweet. Here are some of these attempts. It is still possible to recover the lake region of, of the area before the situation becomes irreversible. In Mexico, indigenous resistance to the usurpation of their land and culture is present at all times. On a later visit to the Chinampas, I was told that it had been destroyed by a real estate developer and land filled and was sold off as property. We have colonization, decolonial attempts, colonization again. When visitors first come to the community museum of the Valley of Hiko, they are taken to a homemade maquette of the lake and the history of the lake is explained. When I met with Hannah and Raimundo, I asked what could I as an artist do about the situation. They said, tell our history. There, this is their mandate, which I have tried to carry out, and that is why I speak about this community, museum, and its history whenever possible. We made a book distributed by Walter Koenig. This one here. Uh, this book, uh, I had imagined very much that it would be a co-authored book, that the community would sign it with me. Um, and I had always imagined it. And, and then um, I said, and uh, how do you want it listed? The name in Spanish or in English, or Spanish first and English second? They said, no, we don't want it signed. We don't want to sign on it. And the reason is that because of the political violence in Mexico, the community was, did not want to co-author this book. Um, it has now become a book for used by the progressive uh, teachers in the area because it's the only history book, is this one, and I can be blamed for everything, okay? And now I'm also co uh, called a historian in the community, and I don't live there, so this is a very good use of us as artists who come in and out to be blamed for some situation like this because we're out and um, we don't suffer the consequences. Um, so, um, for the uh, work in Documenta, I uh, decided to work with the popular aesthetics of the community and work with my cats. So, on the left here, you have the stinking canal uh, with all the information about what happened. This uh, hill here, which had a better image, but I only put one image in. This is the hill, one of the hills that was just, uh, destroyed to pay on. Uh, um, the, the taxes for the Spaniards, and it has no more forest on it. So what happens is uh, the water just comes very quick down, and it goes here and breaks it here. And there is where the poorest of the poor live. This whole area is indigenous uh, people living here, and this is where the single women live. 
because it's the cheapest area because nobody wants to live there because it always breaks there. And you have water coming from the hill behind you and the break because this is where it's at 90 degree, the canal. So it always breaks there. And the women always do end up losing uh, the little things they have in their home, like the refrigerator and the uh, cooking material because of this. Uh, this is uh, the lake area with all the current problems. Uh, last time I exhibited this, I was told that I'm missing a very important piece here. It's not within the maquette, so next time I exhibit it, I, I will have to make a new addition and add it on. It's always being changed as it's being exhibited. And this is the island with Quetzalcoatl, who is the god, I mean, artists should love him, he's the, art, uh, he's the god of music, poetry, life. Also known as the plumed serpent, I think. Okay, so when Hanado came back, um, but when I invited, I asked Dr. Menta to invite Hanado because Amnesty International says that when you have somebody under the threat of life, they should be made visible. So I thought if he spoke in uh, Documenta, and uh, there would be a possibility of visibility, and that might give the people that wanted to kill him a, a more of a reason not to. Um, so then he came back, he, when he was in Documenta, he said he had not understood how contemporary art is important for people. So when he came back from Castle to Hiko, he met with people in the community and they started to have weekly meetings to discuss contemporary art. And soon a small group of young artists formed and have made a collective Hiko art thing. This is some of the, of the processes of the weekly meetings. They were then asked to make a mural in another community. They've gotten to be very good mural makers. Uh, and there's also sometimes um, friends of mine that pop in. This is Fernando Palma. Uh, he's from a neighboring community and he came to give a talk. Uh, the museum also teaches other museums to preserve artifacts and organize, and how to organize a museum. Uh, they also give workshops in schools. That's a local school. Um, and then the exhibit traveled to the Museum of Contemporary Art in Mexico City, Muac. And there we were able to include many artifacts from the community museum in the installation, which we could not have documented due to expense. Um, and as I said, uh, when I show it, I update it, which drives uh, art historians crazy. Uh, but I think it's very important that it be a work in process and that we can keep seeing what are the, the colonial things that happen every day, once again, more and more. So this is a meeting um, to prepare. Oh, okay, wait. So, um, the, uh, there was funds to make a catalog for me. I said I did not need one. And could the museum instead ask the community museum what did the community museum would like? And the community museum said they would like a conference on water. And then it grew to five conferences on water. And I would like to thank Muak very much for getting the funding for the five conferences because it, uh, my catalog would have covered one uh, conference. And here they're meeting. And this is when Paul Tumak and finds out that it's not the museum, Muak, that's organizing the water conferences, but the community museum. Um, and that was a beautiful moment. Okay, this is the community museum's conference that they organized. It, it had some very important situations. Um, the memory, the historical memory, the sacredness of water, uh, self-organizations and movement, microsystems, and um, this was an attempt to organize all the different organizations in the area into one group uh, to fight for water. So they used um, an art institution uh, to organize, and they used art institution money uh, to organize the situation. This was a pre-meeting of the MUAC, uh, for the MUAC, and this gentleman on the right uh, is from a community. Uh, he's a water activist from the 1980s, and he's from a community that stood up to the Federal Army of Mexico. Their water was not taken. Okay, so he's an amazing person. Uh, while they were uh, organizing for the conference, um, 
for the working sessions, the community museum was for the first time able to meet with the graniceros. These are the traditional keepers of the sacred relationship with water who maintain their knowledge and underground temples. It's hidden due to the destruction by the colonizers of traditional knowledge and persecution by the Catholic Church. It is pre-invasion knowledge still actively in use to defend the water. So it's an amazing um, thing to have found the, uh, the knowledge of the Graniceros alive in the 21st century. Uh, the entire community had thought they had been killed. Uh, this is the conference, one of the conferences at the museum. Uh, the museum was closed down for renovation and they were dumped in the stables. So that was how the museum was for I think about two years. Colonization. Then the museum reopened uh, in March of last year and um, got their space back. And then in February of this year, police invaded the community museum and closed down the premises to anyone, quote, who does not work for the current administration. Uh, this is a volunteer who was attacked by the uh, police. This is uh, an illegal act as the police is under federal tutelage and the closure was done by the municipality. Nevertheless, since February, the museum remains closed. That's also why I'm speaking here because uh, the museum wrote to me in February to be able to help as I can. So as an artist, this is what I'm doing. I was doing other things, but I've been, uh, the community asked to put those on hold for the moment. Um, so I have this. But you see there are about a dozen police there. This is in a high crime zone with cartels, with dead bodies in the lake fished up every month. And they put 12 police there. It is a place when I go, I cannot walk anywhere, anywhere by myself. I always have to have somebody from the museum by my side to prevent me from being kidnapped. And yet 12 police are put in front of the community museum. That is colonization clearly stated. What time is it? Five to seven. Five to seven. Okay, so I will only uh, talk about one of the speakers to because of time. Okay, so um, I, there were five, uh, five forest agents I was going to speak about, but to time I will only speak about one. Uh, but it is on my website, and it's all translated into English, so you can just go there and find it. Um, to see the forest standing was commissioned for the exhibit Disappearing Legacies, the World, the World as a Forest. The work is a 19-channel video installation of 34 interviews with agroforestry agents made in 2017. When I went to the Center of Formation of the People of the Forest in Rio Branco in the state of Acre in Brazil. That's the northwest, it's the bit that sticks out on the left. It's a place for experimentation, as well as exchange of ideas and techniques for efficient agroforestry methods on indigenous lands, particularly for areas which have been heavily deforested and destroyed, usually for cattle ranching by the non-indigenous. The participant comes from various reservations throughout the state of Acre and are from the different indigenous peoples, such as the Hunikuin, the Shananawa, the Shenanika, Shamandawa, Yananawa, Kutikina, Mikini and Puliana, Puyan, Puyanawa people. All have survived genocidal campaigns, first by the Portuguese and then the Brazilians at this moment happening. They are responsible through community consensus for managing reforestation, sustenance farming, overseeing animal life, protection of water sources, environmental education program, and protecting the land from destruction. Some of the reservations, particularly those where major highways were planned to deliberately divide up the lands, have continuous problems with gold miners, cattle ranchers, hunters, loggers, and settlers. The forest agents are not recognized by the Brazilian government, not even when we had the more progressive government, and receive no regular income for their labor. And they are subjected to violence from the non-indigenous community. They are the front line for ensuring the possibility that Brazil and the larger world might have a future. 
as Proak Katukina, the president of AMIAKI, the Association of the Movement of Indigenous Agroforestry Agents of ACTI, says, we had dedicated ourselves to seeing that the forest stands. This is now Asharu and Proak Katukina from the Lupikin people. He is the president of AMIAKI. And now I made a summary. If you go into the website, it's there in full. I have just made a summary of what he said but it's in his words, but I just selected some of them. My people and my land are affected directly and indirectly by the highway that has an 18 kilometer stretch cutting through our lands. This has brought many serious problems to the people that live there. The asphalting of the highway also had a serious impact on us. Even so, we are still working according to our culture, tradition, and beliefs. In our community, 95% of the people speak the Pano language. No Portuguese is spoken. Only Pano. We are Pano people. Before the federal constitution and land demarcation, before that we used to migrate from river to river. Whenever game or fish became scarce, we would simply go to a different river, a different place. Now we are living in a defined space with officialized and controlled borders, and we cannot leave this space. It is a small piece of land we have, but we must protect this piece of land. Although the highway BR364 has invaded our land, Anyone leaving the city will see that forests are standing only within demarcated indigenous lands. Before arriving to indigenous land, all you see is cattle and pasture. And then you arrive on indigenous land and you can see the forest. We protect the forest. And we don't do it just for ourselves. We do it for the municipality, for the state, for Brazil, and the world. Where is it that you can find 80, 85% of preserved forests inside indigenous lands? And we want to keep our forests standing and make them larger. The world is getting more worried about the climate. There's much concern about climate change. The people, the white people, they began to worry not so long ago. We have been thinking about it for thousands of years. Until today, we take care of the forests. We keep the forest standing so that we can breathe and live healthily. So we work more each day to protect the forest, to preserve the biodiversity inside indigenous lands. And that is why we're doing our job as agroforestry agents. Amiyaki has been working inside indigenous lands since 1996. On our lands, there is no river where we can have fish, and our game is also disappearing because of the activities of the surrounding areas. They are building more branch roads by the main highways around indigenous land. That's a technique that's used to destroy more land. We are being surrounded by white people, by ranchers, and we are getting worried. We, the Nupiting, are worried that these neighbors might just come in and cut down the trees around our land. We don't want that. We think differently. I think amongst us, the indigenous people of Akri, there's not a single person raising cattle. We do not do that because to raise cattle is to cut down the trees to make way for pasture. We want a different life, planting just enough to maintain ourselves. And I'll just show you images of the following, and then we break. Yakwa, she's uh, the responsible for the entire organization, funding, and um, uh, talking about what the organization does. Buza, he's of the Huni uh, He's also a sculptor, an amazing sculptor, and um, is passionate about his work. Yawa Kushu is also extremely passionate about taking care of the plants. He plants each. All the planting is done by hand with one um, Thing. I don't know what it's called even in English. It's two wood poles like this and a metal thing like this. So we go like this. We do that about 20 times to make a hole to put it in the plant. It's 20 times. Then I pay for that. Each plant is 20 times to do that. This is Buzan. He uh, talked about his grandfather who had saved uh, a small portion of his people from being killed by, um, I think it was rubber barons. And um, he talks about um, his grandfather moving a group of his, of his people to another area and saving them. And he ends his interview by saying, I am the grandson of my grandfather. So um, he's very proud of his history. And um, this is Yupe, he's Humikui. And he's a filmmaker. Um, you can see his stuff on YouTube. Kaku, he's a katukina. He's a healer. 
and um, he uh, explained the government's new policy that happened just as we were filming uh, to, uh, under the Constitution, the agreement was that if you were going to do anything on indigenous land, you had to have permission from the indigenous communities. And the government was going to change the Constitution and say that no permission is needed to go into indigenous land. So um, we heard this in the middle of this work. This is Masha Huni Queen. He, uh, his reservation has problems with bloggers. Uh, they are one of the most violent um, of the settler types. And he said, please do not leave us alone with them. Okay? This is a, a clear example of what can be done, what is needed to be done. Uh, five days ago, uh, Paulo Guajajara was killed by five bloggers in an ambush. Okay? And this is the situation of Brazil today. It's pure colonization, which never stopped. Thank you. tiny bit of insight into what you do, actually, um, taking your position as an artist, as somebody who has a visibility, who has worked uh, on that visibility um, to share the information with publics, that we could do something with the information that we get in either ways. Um, but I also wanted to first ask you, um, beside um, First question would be actually how uh, how how does it take place? How do you start working on those issues? Do the issues find you, or you're going to specific places because you know that there are specific issues taking place there? How how do you usually go around? It's uh, it depends because as the the one with the return of the lake, it was just that I saw this pamphlet from the museum that said that he was an amazing European who destroyed this lake, and I was very angry. So that's how that work started. Um, and this work was because I was doing the, actually I was on a university in the area doing the, the work of the Biennale in 2016. And um, one of my students worked at Amiaki, Soliane Mancinelli. And it was my last day, I had one day free. And she said, oh, would you like to come and visit me at my work? It is a beautiful place. You will like it very much. The forest is still there. And uh, I went and they were doing amazing work because all of it is cattle land. And where Amiyaki is, it was purchased um, and it was cattle land and they bought back the forest. And it was all done by the um, agents, the forestry agents. And so that stayed in my mind and when there was a commission to do a work about the forest, I wanted it to be their voices that you would hear it because it's um, 19 channels, I wish it could be 34. And the whole question is that you would hear the voice. Uh, it would be their voices speaking. That was important for me. And did it happen at any point that you could, um, that you felt that at some presentations that you do either in the form of installations or talks, um, that um, it enables certain um, because they live in a, in a system that is legally organized where they don't have the rights. Um, but does it, in, uh, do you see that it contributes to that fight also through what you do then? Sometimes yes, as in the, uh, the case of the return of the lake, uh, with the, right. that, that was very clear. Um, Hannah and I are still good friends till today. Um, I'm doing a new book about the, the situation, um, so we've been communicating with the new book. Um, and sometimes I cannot, um, I cannot do, I wish I could do more and I cannot do it. And I do not have that uh, enough fame. I don't think fame is very interesting, but at this situation, like for this, for Amiyaki, fame would be very important because I would have then connections to certain um, levels of funding that I do not have. Um, that would be important to, for them to get funding. You know, so um, 
Uh, my level of fame is that I'm being invited to speak normally at um, universities. And let's face it, art students, guys don't have very much money, okay? <laughs> so, uh, so sometimes fame would be interesting for this situation here. But in the case of Return of a Lake, um, I was very effective with, with my means. And so it means also that usually your projects uh, are taking this slow pace, actually, first of all, to do the research. So you go there, you, you start learning about uh, the knowledge from, from there, from the communities. But then also it, uh, that kind of uh, engagement actually enables and also necessitates time. Uh, also meaning time after something that you present as a, probably as a, like you showed us with the return of the lake, you, you constantly correct, uh, the, you almost do like a real time map of it. So it's something that uh, with most of your project, it has that component that you know that you have to return and that it's something that is part of your life, so to say. I've been, uh, I, I, sometimes I'm invited um, to go someplace else and do work with the community. Um, so I was invited to Mongolia. I don't speak a language that works for there. Um, and there is no reason for me to go there. There's not much I could do that could be effective that somebody from that region could do much, much better and much quicker than I could. Um, so I said no to the project as I have been invited to other places. Uh, for curators, it's not so interesting because curators want a new project. Um, uh, not always, not always, not always. Uh, but they don't want like Chico part two, you know, which are like part two. They want something totally different. So I'm getting, uh, I'm getting in that position that's becoming very difficult um, where I say, no, I want to keep working on this. And there doesn't seem to be interest from curators because I keep working, wanting to keep working with these communities, which I can respond to well. I have already um, a long time working with them. Um, and I, uh, I'm a, one artist. I have an assistant who works five hours a week. Okay? Uh, and that's what I have. So any time that um, I take on a new project, it's my hours, you know? Like the, a few weeks ago, I was getting up at three in the morning to answer emails that I answered straight till seven in the morning. And then stopped for breakfast and was really tired. And it's, that was just my, the beginning of my day. Um, and next year, I think I had to change my life because it, this is too much of a, of, a, of a strange way to live a life. <laughs> I have to be a little bit strong to deal with some issues that are coming up. Um, so. Especially now, I mean, in, uh, we, we talked about that uh, just before uh, the conversation, the level of um, pain that you must feel at the moment when um, there is the fascist government in Brazil. You also mentioned very, uh, very poignantly that for certain issues and for, for those communities, nothing much has changed regarding certain uh, specific issues, uh, as you mentioned, but uh, still on the much larger level, it's, uh, it's much worse at the moment as you speak. Um, when we had the previous uh, government, um, there, that's when I did the project in 2016, so far we another project, which I'm not going to explain because of time, but um, it was projects which I was very happy to do because it was about trying to intervene in a situation where within the government structure of Brazil, there was a possibility to negotiate spaces. So my energy was super up, I, you know, like, I could have just been living there uh, and just just coming up with projects con constantly, constantly with di different communities because uh, there was the possibility of, of um, making little spaces for changes that could mean something really important for a community. Um, and now that situation, that is gone. That is totally gone. Right. So. Um, I don't know how anymore to respond to the situation in Brazil. At 11.21 this morning, I got a WhatsApp message from an indigenous leader uh, who I worked with in the 2016 BNLA. He said he's not answering the phone because he's gotten death threats. 
Um, that was at 11.21 this morning when I was looking at a painting, or an amazing painting by an Aboriginal artist. And then, and then I think, could I send an image of this painting? Could, you know? And then I said, or is that a slap in the face of somebody who's facing a death threat in an extremely violent area? Uh, so this is the moment, this is my situation right now. I do not know what to do um, within the situation of Brazil. I can only think um, to make money, you know. So um, I have opened up a design company. It was supposed to be more of a, a lighter situation. But I feel like um, I must concentrate more on that because um, what Amiyaki needs, uh, what this indigenous leader needs, is at least, if nothing else, um, funds funds to buy food. Basically, it's funds to buy food. Okay. And um, that's the only thing I can think I can do right now. I don't think it's a moment to... Um, I, I know that there was one artist that on a reservation that has 30% malnutrition went to do a workshop, an art workshop. And I think that that's extremely problematic, no? 30% malnutrition. Um, so, um, I don't know what else to do right now. Um, yeah, what to say after, after that? I would, I would just maybe ask you to, to share, um, because one, when one looks into that and one knows about the history of violence that these peoples have endured for so long, however, they still go there, they still plant, and their parents have been killed, their grandparents have been killed, but they still, you know, do 20 times as you showed us. And what, what does make one do that? Like, what, where is this force for resistance? Where is this force for, for in a way, for a refusal to, su to submit to, to, to that violence and, and be fearless? Where do, where do you see this comes from? Comes from, um not wanting your, your people to die. And we have this um, history everywhere of, of people saying, no, you will not extinguish us forever. And I am fighting in, you know, they're saying I'm fighting every day. As you said, it's 20 times to open up a hole here, to put this plant here, and you just killed one of us, the federal agent, uh, the federal forest agent that was killed five days ago. But I will keep doing this. Um, I talked earlier with the students about a statue of um, the, um, the Marquis of Pombal, who's from the 1700s in Brazil, and he um, and he prohibited the use of the Guarani language upon the pain of death. Um, it was one of the major languages, and all along the east coast of Brazil, it was the lingua franca of commerce and um, cultural exchanges, and. Um, and the Guarani have Guarani schools now. You know? I am learning Guarani. I will never be a uh, fluent speaker because I have to speak to myself and uh, keep destroying the pronunciation every time. Uh, but I think it is an act of resistance to read some Guarani words every day. And it's part of a situation that says, no, you will not destroy. You will not destroy. At least you will not destroy without a big, big fight. And um, we, this courage exists among many different people. If there are any questions, otherwise I, I have many more. <laughs> I would like to see if there is uh, any urgent comment or question yet. Otherwise, I'm glad to continue. If you have a comment, please speak into a mic. break for uh, for drinks and you will be able to, to speak directly with Maria Teresa but maybe just one other uh, last uh, important note that you keep on mentioning um, is the fact that uh, for example that comes out also in uh, um, uh, in the way that uh, the colonization has never ended for that uh, part of civilization 
uh, and uh, the kind of, uh, well, the situation, for example, which you also quoted in your text, again, uh, the one that I mentioned before, when the fire broke uh, and uh, destroyed the National Museum recently, where all the media has been um, writing subsequently uh, in, in, uh, in dismay and uh, what kind of uh, um, treasures have been lost. And you go and mention precisely the order in which uh, those treasures are mentioned. So it's Etruscan, Egyptian, Greek, etc. And at the end, they say, and some indigenous artifacts. However, there have been audio recordings. recordings. So, um, and it was all the artifacts were destroyed. And, and, and really badly also was the lang language archive. We used to have 1,300 languages in Brazil. Right now we have about 200. And this archive had languages, not the whole 1,300, but it had other languages that were uh, no longer spoken. And this archive was also destroyed. But nobody seemed to notice it. <laughs> Colonization. Uh, on those uh, words, I would really like to thank you again uh, for sharing that um, uh, experiences with us. And I, I just hope that um, they're all fine and safe. Thank you. So if you would like to stay around and talk a little more with Maria Teresa, we will shortly be serving some rum over in uh, Simon Vega's area, some kind of Salvadorian rum. And you can pull up a chair over there and, and come and talk. Thank you.